Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to bring you a special message from the Word of God. We've been studying in the um, Gospel according to John for several weeks now, and uh, we're near the end of the fourth chapter, but today um, I, uh, the Lord led me to take a little break from that to talk about something that's, that's always been dear to my heart and perhaps to yours as well, uh, and it's an appropriate time to do it. Anybody know what Thursday is? Well, yeah, Martin Luther King Day and President's Day and all those, and all these holidays. It's the uh, anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Um, and uh, that's January the 21st. That'll be on Thursday. So I thought I would talk about that this morning. We're going to be studying from Psalm 139, uh, as you might expect, uh, talking about um, the precious nature of the life which God has given to each and every one of us. And so we come this morning to talk about that, and we'll do that from the 139th Psalm, so if you're able, uh, stand with me and follow along at the reading of God's Word. We're going to be reading verses 13 through 18, Psalm 139, beginning our reading at verse 13. The Scripture says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works." and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being uh, unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Father, we thank you for your word, uh, that it is perfect. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you that it's true and accurate in every respect. And so we've come this morning that we might worship you by uh, giving allegiance to your word, by not only reading and studying it, by, but by determining within our heart to apply that which we read and study today. Enlighten us through your word, through the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for having taught us this morning and having instructed us and given us a heart to apply your word. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. And before we get to the details of the, the, the text here this morning, I want to just talk about a couple of the details around Roe v. Wade. I, uh, I've, I've taken occasion to do this every year, and to, to a larger degree sometimes, and to a much smaller degree at other times, but we always give um, thought, um, at least, and uh, to the fact that we've had 43 years worth of um, killing babies, and that's really all it boils down to. We can put all of the, the conventional wisdom to it that we want to, and we can give it all of the politically correct names we want to give it, but it's killing babies. That's what abortion is. But Roe v. Wade is that decision by our Supreme Court that made all that possible. So 43 years ago, um, on January the 21st, 1973, um, and I'll read a little bit of this as I wrote it down to make sure that I got it right. The Supreme Court ruled uh, unconstitutional a state law in Texas that banned abortions except to save the life of a mother. Uh, the court ruled that the states were forbidden from three things, from outlawing or regulating any aspect of abortion that's performed during the first trimester of pregnancy, Secondly, that they could only enact abortion regulations re reasonably related to maternal health in the second and third trimesters. Thirdly, that they could enact abortion laws uh, protecting the life of the fetus only in the third trimester. Very stringent rules that were laid out by our U.S. Supreme Court that shocked 
the Christians in our world, um, and particularly in our nation. Um, but strong wording, uh, they actually forbid, forbid these activities to take place in the states. Most states had some kind of abortion laws in place at the time. Um, but at the time uh, Roe v. Wade was decided, most states had severely restricted or banned the practice of abortion. Now, in the Roe v. Wade case, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but there's some interesting things that I want to talk about that maybe you don't know. And that is, there were two attorneys that brought suit on behalf of the mother, whose name is not Roe. Um, her name is Norma McCovey. Norma McCovey used the name of Doe in order to, I guess, uh, to act in behalf of all other women similarly situated. Such a noble effort, right? So uh, they called her Jane Doe, and she brought lawsuit against the attorney, against the district attorney in Dallas at the time, who his name was Wade. That's why Roe v. Wade. Now, um, they brought this claim, these two lady attorneys that had just graduated from a university in Texas, and they're new attorneys, and they actually took this case and uh, took it to the Supreme Court, claiming that the Texas law criminalized abortions and that violated uh, McCovey's constitutional rights, who we call Roe, her con violated her constitutional rights. Now, uh, Roe claimed that she could not, here's, here was the premise upon which the suit was made. She claimed that she could not afford travel out of state and that she had a right to terminate her pregnancy in a safe medical environment. That's, that was the tenet upon the entire lawsuit. So she filed um, this suit in uh, district um, uh, court there in Texas and uh, went to a federal court, then went on to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and the decision, Roe v. Wade, was a seven to two decision. There are nine Supreme Court justices. Two of the justices says no and seven said yes. And I think even to today, had those justices been differently aligned, we'd have a much, we'd have saved millions of babies, uh, barring any future uh, from that point in time, or subsequent, I should say, um, uh, action in the court. But the, here's what the court argued in their, in their statement. There were, of course, it's pages and pages. The essence of it is the court argued that prenatal life was not within the definition of persons that's used and protected in the U.S. Constitution. That the baby who's in the womb is not, does not meet the criteria to be called a person according to our Constitution. Therefore, they said it's unconstitutional to ban abortions because they're not people. They call them everything else in the world but what they really are, and that is babies. <laughs> they're unborn babies. Now, the interesting thing is that this started in 1971, and it took a couple of years to actually get to the decision by the Supreme Court. McCovey, or Roe, was pregnant at the time she filed the lawsuit. So it doesn't take two years in gestation. The pregnancy was a normal pregnancy, and she delivered a child. The child was not aborted. She delivered the child. It's believed that the child is alive today, 46 years old, living somewhere in the United States. Uh, they don't know that because they, they, they separated the baby so that the, there would not, the identity of the mother wouldn't be able to be identified. So there are some parents who raised that baby uh, who, don't, who don't know that this was the baby that was the target of the abortion law that was, or the anti, I mean, the abortion law that was made years ago. But he, the interesting thing is, the baby was adopted, and McCovey, event, now there was a sister case to Roe v. Wade, the name doesn't, doesn't ring a bell with most of us. I won't talk about it. But there was a sister case with Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is the one that got all the attention and was a precedent-setting case. And the other followed along. But those two women who brought those two cases, they both later abandoned their position and now, for years, have supported the pro-life effort. Isn't that amazing? That the very people who brought the lawsuit are now pro-lifers. They think nobody should be aborted. Um, and they admitted um, 
they admitted that um, virtually every fact on which that their case was built was a lie. Our Supreme Court acted on the premise of some lies. Now, as of, as of two days ago, excuse me, three days ago, um, the total number of children aborted in our United States is 58,586,256. Get that, 58 and a half million babies have been murdered. Um, that's more than a million a year. I broke it down a little bit. Um, and that is, uh, there's 160 babies aborted. If you average them over time, 160 aborted every, day, every hour. Two and a half every minute, or literally 24 seconds between abortions. Every 24 seconds. So we've been in here in our church service now for 28 minutes. And for 28 minutes, two and a half and this is an average, it doesn't mean that they're happening right now, but on average, there's two and a half every minute or every 24 seconds. Now here's another interesting fact that I'll leave with you before we go to our text, and that is over 85%, over 85% of the women who have abortions are single. Now, that brings us to, uh, that brings us to a biblical viewpoint. Um, <laughs> The, the biblical viewpoint on sexual relations before marriage or, or outside of marriage uh, is that we're not supposed to do it. It's called abstinence. Uh, the, only, the, only, the only sexual activity between man and woman, of course all those other uh, odd things that people do that are sinful and wicked by way of homosexuality, and bisexuality and all those other things, uh, that's just plain sin to start with. But within the marriage context, sexual activity is promoted. And, it's, and, and the, the, the marriage bed is, is honorable. We understand that. But outside of marriage, no. And it's called fornication in the Bible. It's called fornication. It's a sin. No fornicator shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So people, there are people out there, fornicators, looking to people that are homosexual, saying, we're not going to go to heaven. Well, they ought to be pointing back at themselves. But over 85% of the women who have abortions are single. Um, they shouldn't have had the baby to start with. And so the babies, all of these babies, have came out of sinful sexual relations. 85% uh, stands to reason based on that. Now, the interesting thing, as I had mentioned earlier, that the court ruled three things. The second thing that I mentioned is that, they, that the states could only, if, only enact abortion regulations reasonably related to maternal health in the second and third trimesters. What is reasonable? Is there anything reasonable about terminating a baby's life? No. There's nothing reasonable about that. That's wording that actually comes out of, um, of the, um, the decision and uh, that they could enact abortion laws protecting the life of the fetus on, only in the third trimester. It's a sad state of affairs. Now, let's see what the Bible has to say about what I call the unborn baby, God's creation. The unborn baby, God's creation. Do you know that every one of us could have been under the knife of an abortion or a suction tube or whatever uh, terminated the life of, of a child. We could have been there, but by God's grace, we're here. Aren't you glad? And to treat unborn babies as just some kind of substance uh, is, is, I'm sure God cringes at the thought every time somebody does that. Now let's take a look at Psalm 139 and verse 13. The unborn baby, God's creation. In verse 13, For thou hast, thou is God, as David writes this psalm, um, and to put it in perspective, in the twelfth verse, um, David says, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. David is talking about the the omnipresence of God, that nothing can be hidden from God. Nothing, absolutely nothing. 
uh, Dr. Hauser mentioned in our uh, Bible study this morning earlier that the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharp and a two-edged sword. It even discerns the thoughts and intents of our heart. There's nowhere we can go, no, no, no thought that we can have, no action we can take that God doesn't know about it. Every single aspect of our being, He even knows the number of hairs on each of our heads. Sometimes we try in our own mind, as finite as it is, because we don't have infinite knowledge, but in our finite wisdom, we tend to reduce God to a person who can reason with the capability that we have. Or they can act with the capability we have. But we understand that God is much greater than that. But in our daily lives, we don't think about that much. But the fact of God's omnipresence uh, was so heavy upon David's heart that he writes this, that even within the womb, God knows. And David uses this as an example. Now, David wasn't a physician. He had limited medical knowledge. But he was sure a wise man, as God had given him wisdom, in inspiring him to write these words, beginning with verse 13. For thou, God, has possessed my reins. Now, um, the word possess here literally means to acquire ownership as the creator of something. That's what it means. It means to acquire ownership um, by creating something. So we could literally say formed or substitute the word created there. For thou hast possessed my reins. Now these reins are our inward parts. And what's described in the following verses helps us to understand that. Not that our outward parts aren't important, but our outward parts can be seen by other people. David was trying to relay, relate to the fact that God is omnipresent. The things that can't be seen, those are the things that are inside. And so it's not that the things on the outside aren't important, but David's focusing on the inward parts because that's what we can't see. And so we sort of look at people, and if we were to look at people... Uh, like God sees us, God sees every intricate detail within us, even while we're in the womb, before we're born. And that's the point of this. But God knows every single thing. We're going to talk about the details of what that looks like. So, thou hast possessed my reins, or literally you've acquired ownership of me by creating me, if you will, uh, and, and creating my inward parts here, the reins. It's really my being, everything within the skin that houses my body. And um, it says here, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The word covered there, uh, it means to hedge in uh, or to shut up. And it's, it's a word that, we, that, we, um, that was used for knitting in those days. For knitting. And so it's knitting together something. And it's not the aspect of knitting with thread and needle, but it's the knitting together of the inward parts of the body. We're going to talk about the inward parts of the body in just a second. But the thing is that at conception, and that's what we're talking about here, and at conception, the fertilized egg is about the size, if you look in your Bible, find a lowercase i somewhere in your Bible and look at the dot over the i. That's about the size of the unfertilized, I mean of the fertilized egg. That's about the size of it. Now, within uh, this particular um, uh, egg that's been fertilized through conception, what we find there is in the speck of what is at that point in time watery material, it's a baby. But it has the substance of watery material. And it's very small, like the dot over an eye that you see in your Bible there. And this, this fertilized egg, even at that point, at the point of conception, contains all the future characteristics of the baby. All of the future characteristics are there. I want to talk about that in a second. Because there are the people that believe that it's just a substance, that it's just material, that it's sort of a wet, slimy thing that they need to get rid of in their body. The reason they want to get rid of it is because it's going to grow up to be the baby God designed it to be. That's why they want to get rid of it. They don't want the baby. They want to enjoy the activity that created the baby, but they don't want the baby. 
Anybody who's been married and has children knows that when you have a baby in your marriage, it changes the dynamics in your family. It changes the relationships in your family. As much as you may be able to, to adequately um, uh, adjust to the changes that take place in your family when you have a child, it still changes your family. It changes your relationship between the husband and the wife. And of course, it introduces those relationships with the children that demand constant attention for a few years until no longer do you have to watch every step or every slide on the floor and to, and to feed every morsel into their mouth because without your help, they won't eat. They won't survive. And so it does change. And so somebody has to have responsibility for that. And then there are arguments in the family about who does it. Who wakes up in the middle of the night? Who gives the bottle? Who's going to feed the baby? Who's going to watch the baby while I go do something? Or you watch it, or you watch the baby. It changes everything. And then when they grow up to be teens, whoa, when you thought that everything was sort of settled and you didn't have responsibility anymore, now it gets even more complicated. Because they're like having these adult minds and adult bodies that still don't have the maturity of an adult. God even told the children of Israel that the, one, the only ones he allowed to go into the promised land besides Joshua and Caleb, uh, the, the good spies who came back with the good report because they weren't fearful of man, they were fearful of God. The only one, other ones to go to the promised land were all the kids that were 20 years and younger, younger when all of this sin happened in the wilderness as God had delivered them out of Egypt. So that age of 20 and below appears to be that age of you're not accountable. So until that point in time, and I've told you the story, I was, I was 18 years old and I got sued by my mother. I was taken to court, appointed an attorney, and I was told that I have no rights. At that time in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, I was told that I'm an infant in the eyes of the state until I turned the age of 21 and I had no defense and I had to surrender everything I had. So I did that because I had to do it. Because your parents are responsible for you until you get to that age of accountability. Yes, it does change our life. It all starts with a little speck that contains all of the things that we're going to be in our lifetime. Yeah, the color of our skin, our, our eyes, our hair, the shape of our face, the, our facial features, uh, our natural abilities, everything that we're going to be physically and mentally are encapsulated into this tiny fertilized egg. And so we look at that tiny fertilized egg at conception and they got these morning after pills and morning after pills kill the baby. Well, it doesn't seem to be and, and, and there are people who say, well, you know, and they look at the baby and say, oh, look how small that thing is. Oh, it's so precious. Well, they don't do that when it's a speck. So only when it seems to take some kind of shape through an ultrasound or some other way to, to picture to us what the baby actually looks like, that it actually has the shape and form of a human being, until that point in time, there are a lot of people who think that it really isn't a baby. The baby started when the egg was fertilized. And to kill the baby at any point in time after that is not a good idea. Because it's killing. It's murder is what it is. Now, from this fertilized egg, and I picked up a few details on this, this little fertilized egg about the size of the dot over the eye in your Bible, it has, um, from that, the baby will develop into, with 60 trillion cells. We can't even count that many. You know, people were trying to figure out how to count one and a half billion when the lottery was at uh, a week or so ago. Start counting to a trillion and then you multiply that by 600. 600 trillion cells is going to be developed out of this one little fertilized egg. It's the beginning of what God has created in the womb of a mother. Is it important? Yes, God created it. A hundred thousand miles of nerve fiber will come out of that little cell. 60,000 miles of blood vessels, uh, 250 bones, a multitude of joints, ligaments, and muscles. The brain itself, the capacity to record so much. You ever recall things that when you were much younger, the brain has recorded that. The, in, the incredible capability of our brain. We only use a small portion of it. 
Uh, sometimes I wonder if God only allows us, if God only allows us to use a small portion, because sometimes we get so much stuff going on in our brain, we sort of get sort of get anxious about it. You ever get that way? You ever lay awake at night thinking about all those things that are swirling around in your mind? I don't. God gives me the ability to sleep. But all these little things twirl around in so many minds, and even when you're doing things, as I'm sitting there, standing here speaking, I'm still, things are going on in my mind that have been recorded in the past and are even taking place right now. And all of that can happen simultaneously. The, the incredible complexity of what God has created in the brain, all of that stuff comes in that little cell. You don't get parts added later that makes you look like a human, be able to perform like a human. They're all there from the very beginning. And our ability to recall things and process things, the ability to make decisions, uh, the ability to reason, all of those things, even to understand God's Word, all of that develops all of that tiny cell. Now, it says there <clears throat> at the end of verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Again, this covering means to knit together. We have been knit together. What is this knitting together? It's like a weaving process of putting things together in our body. So our bones and our muscles... <clears throat> Just take a basic concept here. Our bones and our muscles, they're separate entities. How do they connect? Right? Lig ligaments and tendons, right? Sinews, they call them. So these ligaments and tendons, they serve, designed by God, to connect our muscles to our bones. Tear an ACL one day, or injure a hamstring, and you might understand the importance of some of these ligaments, if you will. Uh, Trace was bowling one day, and he got tendonitis, and he had to lay out for bowling. You know him, he loves bowling four or five days a week, and so having to lay out a bowling for you know, a few weeks was not good. And it was tendonitis in his bowling hand. What did he do? He still went bowling, he bowled with the left hand. But it hurt. <clears throat> But all of, it reminds us that God actually connects things together in our body, and it's that divine, miraculous, and marvelous work of God that brings everything together so that the blood vessels... Okay, so we got all these miles of blood vessels in our body that are interwoven all throughout our body. Who did that? God did it. And person after person after person after person, they, they have a field of, of, of science called medicine, and, and our doctors study that, and they understand that there are commonalities between people. Everybody pretty much has the same uh, nervous system, the same circulatory system, um, and um, you know, the same breathing capacity, and all of these things in the body are tied together very similarly, if not identically, in so many people. It didn't just happen through a big bang. God actually designed divinely the very ingredients that would go together and bring all that together. So while we're forming in the womb, we come from that little egg and we come to the third trimester at the end and we're ready to be delivered. All of that has happened. God has woven all those things together and created all of that stuff. And that's a process that begins here and it continues after we're born and God continues to form our bodies as we come out about you know 18 to 20 inches long and weigh about seven or eight pounds and look at us when we get to be grown right sometimes of us wish we'd be back to eight pounds right well maybe not quite that small but we'd like to lose a little bit of what we gained over time so it says here <clears throat> God's covered me <clears throat> in my mother's womb again the <clears throat> this covering is knitting so God has weaved together all of those important things, all the ligaments and tendons and all those things, God's put it all together. Uh, just ask Brother Dave. He's got some hip problems and he's got some ligament problems. And what God had put together wears out over time. And then somebody's got to figure out how to go in and fix all that stuff, right? But we take our, our, our designs for the fix off of God's design in creation and how he put things together. But in verse 14, what we see is... Um, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Literally, God's miraculous and marvelous and divine creation uh, in the tiny fertilized egg, uh, we ought to praise God from that point on for the person that He has created, formed, 
uh, possessed in verse 13. Created. God. God created this. It didn't just happen. You say, well, you know, there's a natural reproductive process and it's just sort of one of the acts that, actions that takes place through that. Through that recreative process. God creates every life. And God gives it life. And God develops that. We can't take a blob of material and expect all these things just to happen. God literally creates it and weaves it together and brings it out. And so whatever it comes out is what God's created. There are some people saying, well, you know, God made a mistake. He made me in the shape of a man, but I'm really a woman. Oh, really? No. God doesn't make mistakes. God makes you a man, you're a man. He makes you a woman, you're a woman. Uh, and all you got to do is read the scriptures and, deter- and, and understand that. Because women aren't to have relationships with each other. Men aren't to have relationships with each other. Forbidden in the Old Testament. In fact, it was a sin that involved uh, capital punishment. In the New Testament, it's reiterated in the book of Romans. So what do we find here? Praise. Praise. Praise for what God has done. The, the, the baby that God has made within the womb and the mother and the father who truly appreciate what God has given through, through, uh, through conception truly give their utmost praise to God for what's going on if their heart is right with the Lord. The world just thinks it's another baby. <clears throat> and there's somewhere in between where there's people that appreciate it, people that, you know, that have respect for it, and there's people that you know, they exalt the Lord for it. And then there are those people who just truly praise. And David here is giving praise. He says, I will praise thee. Why? It tells us why. For, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God made us. And the wonderment of God's creation is beyond our ability to comprehend. And because it's, it's like infinity. People don't understand infinity. God is infinite. God is infinite. But perpetual, perpetual motion is something we can't, we can't conquer. We can't do that. Only God is infinite. God has no beginning. He has no end. We can only think of beginnings and endings because we're born on this earth. We die on this earth. And our experience is limited to that. And so it's hard for us to think beyond the boundaries of birth and death. But God knows all. And there are no boundaries For God, none. There are no boundaries. There are no limits. God is infinite. And in His infinite wisdom, He's created us. And in doing so, He's given us a finite mind. When we go to heaven, according to 1 Corinthians 13, now we know in part, but we shall know perfectly one day when we get to heaven, God will give us that knowledge. And then we'll know. Right now, what does it take? Faith. Faith. Faith means we trust what God says. And that's the problem. That's the very thing, the essence of what separates the Christian from the unbeliever is we actually believe what God says. Others think, well, eh, I like that. You know, that's good. Well, they just pick and choose things from the Bible, maybe, that they like or don't like because they develop their own humanistic viewpoint and they develop their own opinions about what God has said, or they just ignore God altogether and reject Him. But the Christian understands God's in control. All of those people are unbelievers. God still made them. God still created them. God still wove their inward parts together. And God planned for them what they're going to look like, what their attributes and characteristics are going to be like. It says here, I will praise thee because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. David was confident that the work that God does in the womb is absolutely marvelous in every respect. And he says, I'm confident of that when he says, I know it right well. Now in verse 15, he goes on to say, My substance, uh, and this substance is all of those things within the skin that he's been talking about, and perhaps even here, uh, something that has more substance to it, maybe our bone structure, if you will. We can't see the bone structure. You don't have any bones sticking out of your body. Uh, you gotta, uh, but, but the thing is that break one of them and you'll understand that it's an actual structure. 
Uh, I've had a couple of broken bones, and I understand what it's like to lose that structure that God has created. But he's talking here about my substance um, and, and all of these, the bones and the skeleton and all of this stuff, literally my frame, if you will, was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret. In secret was within the womb, and it's by God's design. God designs the baby. God designs every one of us differently. He designs every one of us differently. Now we sort of get off on tangents and we say, well, because they're a different skin color, because they live in a different culture, because they speak a different language, uh, that, that I don't have to like them, I don't want to be with them, and we sort of develop biases, prejudices, and we look at other people as if they're strange, but every person's created by God. We don't understand, we can't understand why God creates some people who are crippled from birth, why He creates babies who die even in the womb or die at birth or shortly thereafter, why they have various disabilities um, or various abilities. But everybody's made differently. We can't understand why people are different, but that's where we have to trust God. We shouldn't have a prejudiced mind or heart because somebody's different than us. And so we need to look at people in light of the fact that it is God's creation. God is created. So what do people do? Well, now they want to test the baby to see if it's going to have Down syndrome or some other disability that I don't want to be inconvenienced with. And they want to abort that baby. I don't want that one. It's sort of like working in a manufacturing environment where you got widgets coming down the line and you got a quality inspector and looking at that, that one's no good. Throw it in a scrap heap. And the abortion clinics are not much different than that. They sort of look at it like widgets and reject the ones that aren't good. And people are getting abortions because their babies aren't going to turn out like they want them to be. Now, what is that developed into in our culture and society? To people wanting to design their babies. In the future, what we're going to see, if God tarries, Lord willing, he'll come back today. But if he tarries long enough, people may actually have designer babies. And they're already moving in a fast direction that way. They want to get the intelligence of one person and the beauty of another person. And they want to put them together and hope that it comes out right. If it doesn't, we'll abort that one. They want to design their own babies. Whatever happened to trusting in the design that God has? The people that live right across the street from us have a set of twins. My heart breaks for them every day. One of them is a very healthy, vibrant young man uh, that's in middle school. His twin sister has had a disease since birth, and she's been bedridden ever since birth. They have to literally care for her, tube feeding and everything. I mean, it's just keeping her alive. And, but there are two children that God made, and God, God has allowed one to be healthy and one not. They didn't abort the unhealthy baby. They didn't throw it off and get it adopted out. And God, and I oftentimes thought, they're very wealthy people, and I've often thought, God gave them the wealth to take care of that baby. And they take care of that baby very well. And they love that baby. They care for that baby uh, most preciously. And, and it just brings to light the fact that whatever God designs, we need to accept it. Because God designed it. God made the child the way the child is. And we understand that many of our problems in society are because of sin. We can't avoid sin. Even when we're saved by the grace of God, we still sin according to 1 John 1, 8. We're still going to sin. But God says, confess the sin and I'll forgive you in verse 9. Of 1 John chapter 1. So we have that. But sin has created so many problems in our society. It's not God that created the problems. We're the problem. God's not the problem. Accept what God gives to us and run with it. It says here, My substance was not hidden from thee uh, when I was made in secret, literally in the womb. And curiously here has the idea of embroidery. Embroidering. And that's where you take and uh, you stitch something and you apply it. The word means to decorate something with something that's sewn, to embroider. And so this uh, curiously here, we might call it intricately, um, that he intricately wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now the lowest parts of the earth is a phrase that's used figuratively of the womb. 
Because it's as if, remember David's talking about the things that can't be seen. When the baby's in the womb, we can't see that. So it'd be like in the natural environment, those things that are even down in the center of the earth. We can't see those things. We understand it's kind of hot down there. Um, and, uh, you know, I learned from my brother-in-law that you can take water out of the ground and it comes in at 56 degrees. All water is at 56 degrees below the surface of the earth. And no matter where you go, it's 56 degrees. It's a constant temperature down there. Up here, it's hot one day and cold the next day. But it's a constant temperature. It's different down there. We can't see it. Jacques Cousteau went and studied all the oceans and the, the cover of the earth and he found all these, these great and beautiful and unusual fish that we'd have never been able to see otherwise. But it's like that which, is, which can't be seen with the human eyes and God intricately, if you will, through this embroidering process uh, made us our substance and hid it in the womb until it's time for delivery. So in verse 16, thine eyes did see my substance, talking about God, did see my substance, yet being unperfect, the word literally means unformed, even when we were the dot over the eye sized, and yet unformed, God envisioned and designed everything for us. It's all laid out in our genes there. And in thy book... In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now, this has the idea of being remote from view. Um, God oversees every detail, even though we can't see it. And the book here is a figure of speech that likens God's mind uh, to a book of uh, remembrance, if you will. Uh, you have... Uh, you have these little projects you do at home and you sort of take some pictures in the past and you create these books, you put them on the shelf and 20 years later you come back and you look and say, ah, look at this, look at this development process. So it's that kind of book of remembrance, if you will. And not that God needs to remember anything, but he's liking it to that. And um, literally he's indicating that all the days of my life, what David's saying, all the days of my life are foreordained. We see that principle in the New Testament, how we are elected before the foundation of the world. We're predestined by God Himself. And even David had that in mind when he talked about it here. The, the literally uh, omnipresence of God and His omniscience. How great and how vivid David is in his mind capturing the essence of God in the creation of mankind to show what God can do even when in the areas where we can't see. Um, and um, so here in verse 17, he then goes back to his praise that he did in verse 14. He says, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! When God forms that baby in the womb, God creates that baby in the womb, all the thoughts of the future are already formed right there for that baby. John the Baptist jumped in the womb, didn't he? Uh, you know, God is so amazingly powerful that many times we don't understand His presence is everywhere. Sometimes we seem to ignore it. And so there are, in our country, laws that protect women who want to have abortions and kill their babies to the tune of over a million a year. You couldn't terminate life to that degree doing anything else. But because a couple of women decided that they didn't want to have a baby, later changed their mind and became pro-lifers. Uh, a couple of young attorneys out of a Texas law school, the Texas law school, went on and took a case to the Supreme Court and our, and our legislations changed. And there is progress. There is progress. Uh, there's a lot of, we have a, a couple of clinics right here in Louisville. Uh, we got one operating over here in Crestwood uh, that are fighting the abortion clinics. You can go and volunteer at those places. Nicole's place is the one over here in Louisville. You can go um, there and volunteer your time, your efforts. You can stand in the corner. You can try to counsel and witness to people who are going in and having abortions. You can do that. You can support them financially. I'm not a member of the board. I don't get anything out of it. I've just supported them myself and know about them because it's a very worthwhile cause. And places like that are operating all over our United States and they are making a difference. And the rate, the number, the absolute number of abortions is actually decreasing every year. But even at this point, we're still well over a million abortions every year. 
until the law changes, until the law changes, we're not going to make any significant strides against abortion. The law has to change. Uh, Dr. Hauser mentioned this morning, we should vote. We have a responsibility and obligation before God to vote, and we should. That's one good cause to vote for. For somebody who supports life. And somebody who will actually change the legislation. You and I can't do it. But we know people in Congress that probably can. Or maybe sitting in the president's chair. But we need to vote for those people. I believe if Christians were to unite and put their voice to their vote, we'd have a much different environment that we're living in. But unfortunately, too many Christians won't get involved. So what happens? Things like abortion just continue. But how precious are God's thoughts towards us? And in verse 18, we can't even count the thoughts that God has towards us. We can't even count them. And yet, how many thoughts do we give back to the Lord? We don't think about Him much, do we? We don't think about Him much. Think about Him when it's time to go to church. Maybe think about Him while we're here. Think about Him maybe on Sunday night or Wednesday night. How about Tuesday morning on the job? How about Wednesday afternoon golfing? Whatever it might be, are your thoughts centered on the Lord and focused on Him? Or are you distracted by the world and all the things therein and all the battles that go on between people? We need to wake up. It says in verse 18, If I should count them, they are more in number than, any, than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. There's nowhere to hide from the Lord. Now, you say, okay, having said all of that, what do we need to do? Well, we need to pray. That's one thing that all of us can do. We can all pray. If we, if we truly believe what God's Word says, we will pray that the laws of our land will be changed so that abortion will again be forbidden. Totally. We don't get to decide when a life is taken. God creates life and God takes life away. That's the way it should be. So God is the one. So we can pray. We could become an active voice. We could actually talk to other people. I believe if Christians around the world, those who truly know God, uh, Christ is their Savior through faith in Christ, been saved by the grace of God, having repented of their sins, if you go out and you share your understanding of God's truth, it will affect other people. That's why the, number, the absolute number of abortions is decreasing. There are people on the sidewalks in almost every city of our United States where there's an abortion clinic. There's people out there on the sidewalks who can't stand in front of the abortion clinic, but they can stand somewhere around. That's why they, they establish these centers close to abortion clinics. So they can stand on the sidewalk outside that anti-abortion activity, and they can try to get people who have parked their vehicle and going in, and they can try to get to them and try to give them a track, talk to them, counsel them, give them the truth of God's Word, and somehow uh, uh, influence their opinion about what they're about to do. We could do that. And we can do that in the workplace where we work. We can do it in the neighborhood where we live. We can do it in our own family. We can propagate the gospel wherever we are. And this is part of the gospel. So we can make a difference in that respect. Uh, you know, it was a big business guru at one time, uh, and he said that we make a thousand percent change one percent of the time. And that's the way he made his success in business. But the same thing's true with the gospel. You give out a little gospel, a little gospel, a little gospel, and you keep doing it day by day, day in, day out, and you keep talking to the same people, and we plant and we water. We can't give the increase. That belongs to God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But we have to trust God for the increase. The problem is, we don't think there's going to be an increase, so we don't bother to go out and be the light of the world that God wants us to be. Or we put our lampshade on and we want to hide it. We ought to be open about the Word of God. Uh, you know, we're just not bold enough. When Peter and, and John were criticized, beaten, threatened, for preaching the gospel, what did they do? They went back to camp. They gathered up the troops. They all got together in prayer. God shook the ground where they were praying. And God sent them back out and they were more bold than they ever were before. That's where we need to be. Don't be discouraged by the world. Don't be discouraged by popular opinions. Don't be discouraged by the majority. Don't be discouraged by the laws. Be encouraged by the word of God and that God's word will prosper wherever he sends it. Amen. Let's stand together.
Father, we, we thank You for Your love, Your mercy, and Your grace. We thank You for life itself that begins at the moment of conception. Father, we know life doesn't begin some point after conception, but it begins at conception. May we carry that message to others, even though it's unwanted, even though we may be ostracized for doing so. May we carry the message how precious life is and that You create every life. Father, may we be your witnesses and your testimony uh, concerning that, as well as the other aspects of the gospel. Give us courage, Father, as we uh, strive to be obedient to your will and to accomplish your purpose in our life. Thank you for instructing us this morning and for uh, challenging us from your word and for informing us about some of the, some of the activities that are going on in the area of killing babies Father, 58 million babies and Christians still walk around like it's not even happening. Father, it's an indictment against us for not doing something about it, at least opening our mouth and praying. We can do that, Father. We thank You now for touching each of our hearts this morning. We pray that You would lead and guide us through the remaining portion of this week. Uh, And it's all in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.